Well, good afternoon. I'm, I'm David Gantz. Um, I'm part of the History of Text Technology faculty at Florida State University and the editor of PBSA. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different tact to approach today and, and address some of the larger implications of what I see in Martin's charge, um, new directions and future trends. I mean, I'll, I'll confess I'm a little daunted by the prospect of reading bibliographical tea leaves to folks in the audience here, since you are doing the real bibliographical work. You are the, the GPS, if you will. You're doing the day-to-day -day teaching and collecting and curating and research, and so I'm very much looking forward to hearing your responses to my comments. I think an observation by uh, George Saville, the first Marquis of Halifax, would be an appropriate epigraph to lead into my remarks. He wrote, the best qualifications of a prophet is to have a good memory. Bibliographers, students of the book, of printing and publishing history, regularly employ memory in our endeavors through the work of Edward Arbor, Alfred Pollard, W.W. W. Gregg, William Jackson, and Fredson Bowers, to name but a few. And we do so to a greater degree than many of our colleagues in other humanistic disciplines, I think. In that spirit, I'd like to think about future trends through the past, through memory, through the lens of recent change. Specifically, innovations introduced <clears throat> over the last 25 years at one of the great research institutions in the world, the Folger Shakespeare Library. When I first entered the Folger domain, I was a first year graduate student trying to figure out how to write a scholarly edition of a 1617 London Lord Mayor's pageant that I would subsequently uh, submit as a term paper that, that spring. Access to manuscript and printed book holdings began by manually searching the card catalog. Readers consulted their materials in one of the two reading rooms, and analytical technology was limited to pencils, rulers, and for uh, serious bibliographers, calipers. <clears throat> in fact, during one of my early visits, I was harshly admonished, harshly, by Peter Blaney for using a small four-watt portable light to view watermarks because, as he said in dire tones, it is fluorescent. Now, the, and the results of research were submitted as type manuscripts or for the more tech-savvy through dot matrix printers and published in codex form. Jump ahead 28 years. The reading rooms are the same, although I understand planned renovations may change that. The where remains, <clears throat> but how readers find, consult, analyze, and publish their work has been transformed utterly. The Hamnet OPAC is not merely a consulting catalog or a finding aid, but thanks to the efforts of talented librarians and bibliographers, now contains valuable descriptive information concerning each item, but particularly the STC items. Heralded by the works of Thomas Gravel and his application of dialects to watermark reproductions, electronic technologies are now more than welcome, including Wi-Fi connected laptops, flat light sources, portable collators, and other devices readers use to expand the reach of their eyes and their minds. Perhaps the most visible technology now regularly wielded is the smartphone camera. Encouraged by the Folgers' adoption of Creative Commons licensing for publishing permissions. Complementing reader photographs is the large, vast collection of digital image facsimiles offered in the online lunar resource, images produced and mounted with an awareness of the need to provide uncropped facsimiles of an entire volume, not just the pages containing the text. Thus, bindings, binding leaves, inserts, and other often ignored informo information is included in the reproduction. And of course, now scholarship is widely available via the internet. In other words, the technologies now employed by book scholars are reflected in the changes of the physical circumstances and networked resources of the Folger Library. At the risk of adopting a deterministic attitude, I think we can predict this trend will, contend, will continue, that local and computer-based technologies will play an increasingly integral part of book studies. These are the obvious new trends extrapolated from past experience. To think about future, ex uh, future directions, though, I'd like to recall Marshall McLuhan's often misunderstood assertion that the medium is the message. By medium, he meant 
any extension of human capacity, any tool or technology, whether it's a hammer or an electric power grid or the automobile, the message is the unanticipated social and institutional consequences of that new medium. For example, for the medium of the automobile, one of its messages is the suburbs. What is the bibliographical and research method, message? That is, what are the disciplinary consequences of this new medium? The widespread adoption of networked computer technologies in the study of books, printing, and publishing. I'll hazard a few thoughts. Easy access to OPACs like uh, Hamnet or the ESTC, digital facsimile collections like Luna, Ebo, and Echo, and online textual tra uh, transcriptions such as Ebo TCP or electronic scholarly editions such as the uh, Cambridge Ben Johnson means that an increasing amount of primary research now takes place remotely. What used to require an on-site examination of the physical object now in many cases takes place through the consultation of remediated electronic materials. As Tom Tanzel has repeatedly reminded us, a facsimile, whether text or image or a mixture of both, is a new object and distinct from its physical sources. The roots of substituting facsimile for original object go back at least as far as the advent of cheap photographic reproduction. For my dissertation, for example, I optically collated dozens of copies of the Ben Johnson 1616 folio works using as my control copy a published photo facsimile of the volume from the Bodleian's holdings. However, to guard against misinterpretations of evidence, I also collated the facsimile against the Bodleian source copy. And I found a number of instances where the facsimile's editors changed details of the image. I suspect in many cases contemporary scholars employing textual and image facsimiles do not take this precaution. Consequently, they risk using evidence derived from facsimiles that purport to represent the object, but which differ in small and large ways, either through human or machine intervention. One of the messages of computer technology, then, one of the unanticipated consequences is the growing acceptance of facsimiles as valid substitutes for source objects, and potentially a new class of error, and possibly misunderstanding, misinterpretation. This phenomenon extends beyond commercial or institutional facsimile publishing. As anyone who has worked in a rare book library in recent years can attest, photography has begun to replace reading is the primary activity of scholars, particularly younger ones. The pressures on graduate students and junior faculty to publish widely and often has forced younger readers to collect as much material as possible during their stay at a research archive. iPhones have supplanted notebook and pencil as the primary tool for the gathering of evidence. As a medium, a technology, I think personal photography potentially carries carries with it a less chance of remediation error since the producer is also the consumer, although the quality of the facsimile can often obscure. The problem arises when the reader returns home and attempts to make sense of the megabytes, sometimes even gigabytes, of images stuffed into that device. When I photograph type samples, drop caps, ornamental letters for a bibliographical description, I spend the bulk of my time measuring the types, spent recording their placement in the volume, noting the file name of each image I take. The photograph is but part of the evidence, only makes, making sense in the context of the details gathered through careful examination of the physical objects. By photographing now and analyzing later, the material context is lost. The physical data required to transform image into evidence. In this way, the hurried, harried reader opens up the possibility of another class of misunderstanding, not the silent change wrought by editorial or machine intervention, but the loss of information and thus insight. Another message of computer technology, then, is the flattening of analysis due to the shift from primarily physical to primarily photographic data collection. In my role as editor of PBSA, I've also noted a corollary trend emerging in, res in published research. Because reader photography is so widely accepted in North American archives and special collections libraries, 
scholars have begun including a large number of illustrative images in their submissions. This in, in itself is not problematic, uh, each image proverbial worth a thousand words. Rather, I've begun to grapple with authors who subtly, in all likelihood unintentionally, replace careful verbal description with facsimile images. Some here today may recognize echoes of this approach in earlier arguments that inexpensive image facsimiles have replaced the need for quasi-facsimile title page transcriptions in bibliographical descriptions. The, the two shifts in attitudes don't correlate one to one. Describing a 15th century manuscript missile is not the same thing as constructing the ideal copy of a 19th century printed edition. Nevertheless, nevertheless a, a, a slow disciplinary shift in attitudes toward the value of facsimile images is another message, another consequence of adopting new technologies into bibliographical work. Other new directions are more hopeful. As libraries uh, have been placing digital images online at a breakneck speed, literary scholars have begun to notice, non-bibliographical literary scholars. A number of my colleagues in, literature, in the literature world have discovered the archive <laughs> and excitedly described its wonders at conference papers. A renewed interest in materiality surely cannot be a bad thing, especially among those raised to distrust empiricism. At the same time, students and young scholars attracted to the history of the book have evinced growing curiosity in bibliographical concepts and methods. It's my impression, and Michael Suarez, if you're here, um, you can check me on this. It's my impression that the enrollment demographics in rare book schools' foundational introduction to descriptive bibliography has changed in interesting ways. In the past, we saw a number of booksellers and senior scholars in the course. Now, graduate students, junior faculty, and younger librarians dominate. One of the catalysts for this renewed interest seems to be digital humanities, where young scholars trying out the methods of DH on book history run up against the problems of evidence and turn to bibliography for help. Computer technologies, then, have triggered a new direction, or, or rather, perhaps a, a rebirth of past but discarded directions toward bibliographical and textual studies. I hope this new direction flowers into a renewed interest among graduate and library studies programs to again offer training in books, printing and publishing. So if I had to sum up my thoughts on new directions, new trends in bibliographical research, and here again I'm, I'm channeling McLuhan, it's that these new technologies, technologies we've embraced do not necessarily signal progress, that is, they are not enabling us to do the same things we've always done, only better, faster, smarter. Computer-based methods have begun to alter the very nature of what it means to study books, printing, and publishing. What we mean when we say evidence. The difference between object and its reproduction. Visual versus verbal description and analysis. At the same time, digital facsimiles have sparked a wider rediscovery of the, their physical sources and archives and recognition that how you compile data put into a computer model alters the nature of the results. So these are just a few general observations, and um, I look forward to your reactions and responses to my prognostications.